Amen. You can grab a seat tonight. Can we give this amazing worship team a huge round of applause? What a beautiful, beautiful song. That song was actually written from Mosaic Church. That's Pastor Irwin's church. Yeah, I love that song, Glory and Wonder, man. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord to give me a real voice because I'm a worshiper, but I'm tone deaf. That's a tough spot to be in. <laughs> If you've got a Bible, why don't you reach for it tonight and turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3 is what I want to read from for the next few moments. And we titled this conference, City on a Hill. And this is not just some kind of theme that we put up on the wall, but it's really, I think, a mandate that God wants us to walk out. Uh, I really believe that the time is now for us to raise up a generation of people who won't live timid, who won't live quiet, who won't live afraid, who won't live ashamed, but rather we would be bold, that we would recognize that we are the light of the world, that we are the salt of the earth, that we are a city on a hill. You don't gotta be creepy, you don't gotta be condemning, you can be radical, real, normal, you can be awesome, but you gotta be bold and you gotta go for it. And I don't wanna take this faith public, amen? And as I was coming around uh, this night one of what I wanted to share about, um, I just kept coming back to this message. Uh, it's a message I felt like the Lord really revealed to me just a few weeks ago. And it comes from Daniel chapter 3. And um, tonight I think God wants to speak to us. And tonight we prayed in the back. We pray for people tonight that don't know Jesus. We're believing in a few moments you're going to encounter him. But we're also praying for Christians tonight. And after tonight, this would, be, this would be one of those moments where you draw a line in the sand you say, you know what, I'm not going back. I'm moving forward, the cross before me, the world behind me. I've decided to follow Jesus. I'm going to live loud for Jesus. We're believing that tonight you're going to be marked like never before. And I think we should just jump right into it. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Another translation says, O majesty. I like that they're like given attitude, but they're still being like polite. Verse 18. But even... If he does not, whew. but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. We're talking about going public. We're talking about living loud for Jesus. We're talking about being a city on a hill. I think before we can do any of those things tonight, I want to preach to you from this thought, even if, even if. If, and this is going to be a night I think that some of you will never forget. I was 17 years of age in a conference kind of like this where God spoke to me. I was marked by God. God called me into the ministry. I never looked back, I've stumbled. I've fallen quite a few times. But how many of you know that as believers, when you fall, you are never down. You are either up or you are getting back up. I've been hanging on to one word since I was 17. And I'm believing tonight that some of you, you're about to get a word that you're going to look back 10, 20 years from now saying, that was the moment that I was marked by God. I decided to follow Jesus like never before. Do you believe that tonight? Oh, I'm going to preach it like I feel it. So I know it's like Friday night. We still got Saturday night, but I'm just going to preach it like I feel it. I got a silk shirt on and um, I'm showing way too much leg up here, but hey, don't judge. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you so much. God, we are so, so thankful that we could be here tonight. Lord, we just sense that you're at work. Lord, we just sense your presence is here. And Lord, we don't want to waste one moment in your presence, God. We want to be open, Lord, to what it is that you have for us. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We are here for such a time as this. The time is now. If it's not us, then who? And if it's not now, then when? So God, I pray that tonight you would fall in this place. Do what I can't do. Speak through this broken vessel, Lord. And let it not fall on deaf ears, but let it fall on open hearts. Tonight, Jesus, we declare, Lord, that these things, Lord, they're going to happen in this house. 
we honor you we praise you and if you believe it tonight come on all of god's people said all of god's people said come on vu conference if you believe it tonight give god a big shout of praise <laughs> amen amen how many going for golden state tonight How many going for the traitor, Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James? <laughs> Miami turns their back on people quick, man. Chino's saying, let's go heat. Bro, they're done. He said, I believe in the God of resurrection. It doesn't work that way in the NBA. How many of you out there, you would say that you, you love movies? Who are the people that actually, you love movies? All right, we're going to step further. How many of you out there, you would say, when people ask you the question, what's one of your favorite hobbies, your reply is movies. Who, where are you at? Is that, okay, those are the diehard people right there. I, um, I love movies, man. I don't know, something about a good movie. You can kind of escape from reality. You can begin to live vicariously, if you will, through some character. Movies can take you to a distant land. Movies can take you to a fantasy world. Movies can take you to different time periods. I love, I love movies. How many of you, you remember the days of Blockbuster? If you're below the age of 18, you're like, what is that? Was that tongues? No, it didn't happen yet. Rest in peace, Blockbuster. I, I honestly, I remember... When I was like a teenager, part of my Friday night plans when I was saying I was getting ready to do something, like part of those plans included Blockbuster. Like it wasn't just about renting a movie, it was the experience of Blockbuster. I would spend an hour in Blockbuster perusing the aisles, the drama section, the action section. This new generation, man, I was sitting with my brother on the law the other day on the TV, he's like, Siri, uh, help me find a drama. I'm like, bro. There's no effort whatsoever. I think one of my favorite things about movies is, is like I'm one of these kind of guys that like I'll have favorite movies and I will remember all the lines in the movie. Like I know every Disney song. I don't want to do it. Stop, 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 stop. My wife won't let me. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the boy? The boy who's got everything. I've got gadgets and gizmos of plenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You wanna think about, ha, huh, I've got 20. <laughs> but who cares? No big deal. I want more. I, I, I'll go there. I'll go there. It's easy. I think what I like about movies is like, you ever notice like in movies, there's always like these like defining moments where a certain line is said and it's like the line of the movie. It's like the line of the movie, you're like, I'll never forget that line. Like, like it's, it's a statement, it, it's, it's an expression, it's a phrase and, and people will say it. It typically, if you notice in movies, it usually happens after a great victory or in a moment of great pressure. One of my favorite movies, Rocky. Hey, yo, Adrian! Don't you hey? Oh, sorry. One of the greatest movies of all time by the greatest actor of all time, Titanic, Leonardo DiCaprio. It's no longer a debate, people. He won an Oscar. It's been settled. Greatest actor of our generation. But remember, remember Titanic? It's like this beautiful moment. And he's like, he's like, never let go, Rose. Never let go. Celine Dion, you know, near, far. It's my favorite, right? What's Rose's most famous line? Jack sinking. She's going, come back, come back, come back. I'm like, he could come back if you would scoot over on that piece of wood and let old boy on. He's drowning. She's like, I don't have enough room, come back. Crazy. Think about it for a moment. Oftentimes, when pressure surmounts, oftentimes when life tries to squeeze you, the question is what comes out of you? Because you can look back through history. 
And as you look back through history, when do men and women's most famous words come out of their mouth? It's typically in a moment of real pressure. Think about the Prime Minister Winston Churchill as they are in some real challenges in World War II. He gets up and gives his most famous speech of all time. It's just a few short words, but he simply says, never, never, never give up. Dr. Martin Luther King, in a time when our nation was so divided, segregation and civil rights, he gets up on the steps in front of the Washington Mo Monument, and he gives his most famous speech, I have a dream. It was when he was having real pressure, real adversity, that his most famous words came out of his mouth. How about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He's hanging, stretched wide, hanging high, nails in his hand, and he shouts out as they put a spear in his side, a crown of thorns on his head. He declares, it is finished. In his most challenging moment, his most famous words came out of his mouth. Question for you tonight is, is when life squeeze you, what comes out of you? Because here we have in Daniel chapter three, a pretty amazing story. And many times when filmmakers are making a film, what they'll do is they'll start filming the end scene first and then they'll work their way backwards. And tonight, I want us to kind of start at the end of the movie because if there was a story in the Bible that should be a movie, it should be this story right here of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This story is nuts. And maybe you've never been to church. Maybe you've never heard this story. But I'm, I'm going to tell it to you tonight. This is a crazy, wild story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These boys were, were Israeli boys. And this was in a time when Babylon, which was a superpower at the time, came and destroyed Israel and took slaves from Israel back into their secular world. Now, many of us, we are from the 305. We're from Miami. and Come on now. Many of us, we look around our society today and we say, wow, Miami, where is God? Because this place seems so dark. This place seems so chaotic. This place seems to be in real crisis. Yet, let me just tell you, if you think Miami's bad, you have no idea what Babylon was like. Babylon, as you study in the history books, it wasn't just secular for that time period or godless at that time period. It goes down in history as one of the most godless societies that was ever created. And these Hebrew boys are stolen from their nation and they're brought and they're put in to Babylon. Now the Bible says that they begin to rise through the ranks and they actually become a chief advisor to King Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because favor is not found in where you are. Favor is always found in who you are. You say, Rich, are you scared about our city? I'm not scared. Rich, are you intimidated by our city? I'm not intimidated. Why? Because I got a story about three Hebrew boys that rose through the ranks and made a difference in a dark, secular, godless world. The Bible says that they are brought to Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he forms this golden image, 90 feet tall. The Bible tells us that every time he asked for the music to be played, that everyone was forced to bow down to this image. Yet one day as the music is played, these three Hebrew boys, they don't bow down. Instead, they stand tall. Now, when I read the Bible, I honestly like, I see characters. You know what I mean? Like, I, I see personalities. The Bible tells us that we have Shadrach. I think Shadrach was like the leader. You, you know, I think he was the guy that was always positive. You ever met somebody who's so positive, they almost kind of make you negative? <laughs> I think he was like super Christian. Like, God is good <laughs> all the time. Isn't this great? We're in Babylon. No, you know? I think Meshach was like that, that Christian who was like barely saved. You know what I'm talking about? Had a little hood in him still, you know? Like, had a little gangster. He's like, oh, I wish. I wish Babylon would do something. I wish, I wish I did call fire down from heaven, you know? And then I kind of see, I kind of see a Bendigo as kind of like, he's kind of like on the fence, like, guys, really? Like, I don't know about this. This is kind of scary. I'm not sure. 
So I got these three person, I got these three guys, and finally the music is played. It's a real moment of real challenge, but in that moment, they give their most famous words. And here's the words that they say. King Nebuchadnezzar says, hey guys, if you don't bow down, I'm gonna throw you into the fiery furnace. This is a crazy story. A furnace, what are we talking about? This is what the guys say. They say, oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, our God can save us. Our God will save us. But even if he doesn't save us, we're still not bowing down. Oh, come on, VU Conference. I know it's just night one, but we're going to get there tonight. I, I think this phrase is one of the most practical application statements of faith that we have in the Bible. Because what do they say? They say, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, first and foremost, our God can save us. I felt like someone walked in here tonight and you have given up on the fact that God could and can save you. But you need to be reminded that you serve a God whose arm is not too short, his ear is not too deaf, he hears you, he's the God who takes the impossible and he turns it in to the possible. Our God can save. Do you understand how big your God is? Like he's big, man. The Bible says that he breathed stars into existence. You ever done that before? <sighs> how do you do that? <laughs> Stars, <laughs> galaxies, <laughs> Milky Way. <laughs> Yet another verse in the same book of the Bible says that our God, he knows every hair on our head. Who has that much time? <laughs> How does he know every hair on your head? Girl, some of you with a weave, guess what? He knows about that hair too. <laughs> You're like, he knows about this? Yeah, the fake stuff, he knows about it. They don't stop there. They establish that our God can save us. We need to raise up a generation, man, that understands the power, the omnipotence of our God. He's still a miracle working God. He still shows up late in the midnight hour. He turns situations around. But look, they take a step further. They go, our God will save us. Whew. It's one thing to know he can. It's another thing to declare that he will. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we cannot see. What are you hoping for tonight? Are you sure of it? Whew. What is the thing that you can't see tonight? Can you be certain of it? See, these guys are talking about the fact that we serve a God who's not only able, but he's willing. This is important that you know. This is the gospel. Those of you that have come in tonight that aren't familiar with what Jesus did. Jesus came to us because we could not get to him. If you've ever wondered what God looks like, all you have to do is look at Jesus because Jesus is God in the flesh. And there was a great chasm between us and God. So guess what? Jesus came and he bridged the gap between us and God and he takes us to a place that we could never get to on our own. What does Jesus reveal to you and I? He reveals that he's willing to come to us. Does not crush the brokenhearted. Does not put out the wick, the flame that's burning. He, he loves you. He's close to you. He's willing to save you. But then these guys say the dopest statement in all of the Bible, I think. Aside from it is finished. <laughs> Our God can save us. Our God will save us, but oh king, they're still being polite. That's what Christians do. <laughs> oh king, even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. They got a fiery furnace in front of them. You talk about adversity, you talk about pressure, but the thing that comes out of them is even if faith. See, the real test of faith is when God doesn't behave, how do you behave? When God doesn't do what you want him to do. So many of us in your night, even as believers, we're going, God, why does bad stuff happen to good people? And I don't know the full answer always, but I want to flip that thing on its script. And I say, guess what? What happens when good people happen to bad things? 
We need a group of people like never before that will rise up with this even if faith to declare, guess what? Whether or not God saves me in the way that I want him to be saved, whether he heals me in the way that I want him to heal me, when God doesn't play by my rules, I'm still not bowing down. He's been far too good to me. All I gotta do is look back and that's what leads me forward, even if. People go, man, yo, we need, you know, if the White House changes, then we have change. But change doesn't start in the White House. Change starts in your house. Change starts when we, as the next generation, we realize that we can serve our God and we can believe that he's good even when things seem bad. I wondered, what would happen on night one? What would happen if you would leave this place with this even if anthem? Even if I don't get the promotion, I'm still going to praise God. Even if I don't get the report from the doctors that I want, my God will still be worshiped in my house. Even if that relationship is never reconciled, guess what? My God has never left my side. He's always been closer than a brother. I'm going to keep worshiping him. Even if it looks all bad, I'm still going to declare my God is all good. Even if he doesn't show up the way that I want him to show up, guess what, King? We're not going to bow down. Even if. When pressure hit their life, their most famous words came out, and they were, even if. This is... The climactic scene in Daniel chapter 3. And like a good movie, we've established the great climactic theme, but now we must go back to discover how on earth do you get to a place where you can confess even if. Because we can shout till we're blue in the face, but man, it is time that we strategize. It is time that we equip one another. It is time that we resource each other because guess what? Our time is now. I want to give you just three little postures, if you will, that we have to take on as believers if we're going to ever arrive at an anthem, at a mantra that says, even if. And the first word, I want you to shout it out. Everyone say, sit. sit. Before you can declare even if faith, you have to sit. Here's a fun question. Who are you sitting with? When I first moved to Miami, I came from Tacoma, Washington, and finally the Lord brought me to the promised land, Miami. <laughs> and I got here, and honestly, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was all cool. And I, you know, I was a freshman in high school, and everything about new school I was, I was cool with. I was, like, I was liking it. But there was always this one dreaded moment in the day, and that was the lunch period. Because during the lunch hour, you had to pick a lunch table to sit at. And I don't know when the last time was that you were in a high school lunchroom, but that place is confusing. There are so many people groups in there. It's more confusing than the United Nations, man. It's nuts up in there. I used to get so nervous because like, who am I going to sit with? Who am I going to sit with? Who am I going to sit with? I got to find a place to sit. I got to find, find a place to sit. Down deep, we all really want to sit at the popular kid's table, you know? We don't want to admit that because we're humble and like, we don't care, but we care. I think the popular kid's table reminds me of first class on an airplane. I've been doing like some crazy travel the last three weeks. I was, uh, I was in Auckland, New Zealand, then I was in Montana, back to Miami, from Miami to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem uh, back to Miami, from Miami back to Guatemala, Guatemala back to Miami. It's been crazy. And my little brother-in-law, David D., he's here somewhere tonight. He's been traveling with me. And it's funny because typically when I fly, you know, on an airplane, we just, we just kind of fly in coach economy, you know, just the back. We're just humble servants of God. And... Um, <laughs> And it's funny because like me and David D, we'll be getting on the airplane like, and we'll, we'll walk past first class. We're like, these people, man, shoot. They don't know what's up. They don't know about real hardship, you know? <laughs> but every once in a while, because I fly a lot, I'll get upgraded in first class. It's amazing because me and David D are like, I'm like, what D, whatever, man. Forget them, yo, man. We got We'd be in the back, 37B. Let's go, you know? <laughs> But the other day, me and David, I'm like, yo, man, this is tough. And I sit down at 37B. All of a sudden, the stewardess, she comes up. She goes, Mr. Wilkerson, you have been upgraded into first class. 
I was like, deuces, David D. Favor ain't fair. I left him so quick, never thought about him again. <laughs> I kind of think the popular kids table at the lunchroom, everyone's like, oh, we hate the popular kids. Then they invite you over, you're like, I made it, you know? <laughs> but the reason why it was so confusing as to where to sit was because who you sit with matters. Because who you sit with typically dictates who you are. What I find so amazing about Daniel 1, 2, and 3 is every time these Hebrew boys are mentioned, they're always mentioned in the crew, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Never are they ever mentioned alone. But rather, I think the scriptures are showing us that they were walking as a unit, they were walking as a crew, they were walking as a posse, as a clique, if you will, and as they did life together, they were able to take a stand for God. See, who you sit with is who you listen to. Who you sit with is who you will become like. Some of us were at this conference this week. We're like, God, give me a word. Give me a rhema word. You use these words. You don't even know what they mean. You're like, I need a big word. Give me a prophecy. Here's a prophecy. Get the right group of friends. Commitment tends to last better in community. You were not designed to do this faith journey alone. Some of you are going to walk out of this conference so pumped up, so full of faith, speaking in tongues, calling fire down from heaven, but you're going to walk out into a cold, rainy world, and if you're all alone, guess what? That fire, it's going to burn out. But if you'll just make a conscious decision to say, you know what, I gotta sit with the right people. Who I sit with matters. I need a crew, I need a clique, I need some Jesus followers that are gonna stick with me on this journey. Because I can see these guys. I can see Shadrach, come on guys. It's early in the morning. Shadrach, it's 5 a.m. I know, come on, we're gonna worship Jesus. Shadrach, I don't think Jesus is awake right now. Shut up guys, we're gonna worship. I can see Meshach. Come on, let's pray against our enemies. Come on, let's call fire down from heaven. I can see Abednego like, I don't know if I want to get up. They're like, come on, Abednego, we got this. And they were stoking the fire that was inside of each and every one of them. If we're not careful, we'll allow ourselves to live life unhealthy. We'll allow ourselves to live life isolated. We'll allow ourselves to live life all alone. And we'll come up against obstacles and when you're doing life all alone, the obstacles seem so much bigger when you're alone. It's funny, my wife and I, we live in a, a loft in downtown Miami, just across the bridge over here. And uh, it's like one big room. It's cool if, I come, if you come to my house, I'm like, hey, here's the tour. You're like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm like, all right, let's sit down. <laughs> yeah. And there's no closets in our house. And so uh, when we first moved in, we had to go, and we're balling on a budget, so we went to Ikea. And... Um, Praise God for Ikea, uh, except for the fact that you have to, you know, put those things together. And um, we bought these massive closets. They got these big mirrored doors, you know. And about four or five months into living in this apartment, those, those closet doors, they broke, and it was Don Cherie's closet door. Like, no longer could you move it back and forth. And to be honest with you, like, I'm not really, you know, <clears throat> gifted with the tools. <laughs> Shut up. And so, I'm, 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 this is a confession moment right now. For two years straight, <laughs> we just lived with broken closet doors. Because I, I saw, I was like, yeah, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> two years. Don't you like reaching into the closet, like, I can't find my shoes. Like, you're fine. Come on, suffer for the gospel. You know, like. <laughs> About two weeks ago, two of my friends I do life with from Voo Church, they were over at my house and they're sitting on the couch and they go, hey Rich, you know your closet door's broken? I was like, really? They're like, oh yeah, it's broken. I was like, Phew. I was like, I don't know how to fix it. I mean, it's just, it's, I'm fine, I'm good with it. How many know you, you can't change that which you tolerate? How many of you know you get what you allow? I said, I said, it's broken. 
It's broken. We're good, though. Dawn Tree doesn't mind leaning in to the closet to find her shirt. She's fine. She's good. I said, I don't want to fix it. All of a sudden, one of my friends says, bro, I can fix it. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, there is a God somewhere. <laughs> can I be honest with you? They went over the closet door, and in, in 15 minutes, <laughs> in 15 minutes, they fixed my closet door. I thought to myself, isn't that amazing? I've had the same problem for two years that could have been fixed in 15 minutes. I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell some people that tonight you've had a problem for three years, five years, but if you'll get the right people in your life, if you'll sit with the right people in 15 minutes, God can turn it around. It can be fixed if you get the right community around you. Come on, VU Conference. Make a little bit of noise tonight. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live unhealthy. You don't have to live offended. You don't have to live broken. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're free. Who are you sitting with? Because who you sit with will dictate who you become like. I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because every time their name is mentioned, it's mentioned in the group. If we're going to have it even in faith, we've got to sit. But secondly, after you sit, you have to stand. And I love that story of Shadrach, Meshach. The, 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 the music goes off. Can you imagine like, what that would have been like that day? Like Everybody bows down, but you just look up and there's Shadrach, you know, <laughs> not bowing down. There's Meshach, like, mm, I wish you would, devil. <laughs> There's Abednego, he's like, he's like, Abednego's like, can we curtsy at least? Maybe we should curtsy, you know, like. <laughs> you want to talk about going public with your faith? You want to talk about being a city on hill? You want to talk about by not letting your light be hidden? These guys are a picture of it. But yet you say, how do you take such a public stand? You'll never go public if you don't first go private. Before you can go public, you've got to go private. Because you're just reading the end of the story. Even if, what a climactic moment. In this real moment of pressure, their most triumphant words come out. But how? It's because this wasn't the first time they ever took a stand for God. They had been taken stand after stand after stand. In fact, the Bible says they were taken out of their homeland. They are slaves. I want someone to catch this because you keep coming up with all the reasons as to why you can't flourish. You keep coming up with all the reasons as to why you can't be great. These were slaves living in a secular world. And they show up on the scene and they're brought into the king's chambers because they possess some amazing qualities. And right off the bat, they are put on the king's diet. But these men, as Jewish boys, they were under the law, so they could not drink wine, they could not eat certain types of meat. So they came to one of the king's officials and they said, hey, let's make a deal. Why don't you give us 10 days eating the way our God tells us to eat, praying the way our God tells us to pray. We're gonna only eat vegetables and we're only gonna drink water. Let's see what we look like after those 10 days. They were taking a stand. Nobody was recording it, but they were taking a stand. The Bible says after 10 days, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they had so far exceeded all of the other men that were in the king's chambers that they were automatically brought into the king's court. And from that day forth, this is what the Bible says, that they were 10 times better than all of the king's magicians, astrologers, and advisors. Doesn't surprise me one bit. You're a Christian. You're a follower of Jesus. I think you ought to be the best employee at your job. Ooh, I don't care where you work at. You're going to be the best. Why? Because not only are you talented, you're also kind. Not, all, not, not only are you skilled, you're humble. You got it all. There is no doubt in my mind that as believers of Jesus, we should always rise to the top. But we have to be willing to take a private stand before we'll ever take a public stand. Come on, I've heard a clap. Let's just all clap together. Come on, you get this one time a year. We might as well have some fun. Here's what I've learned. I've learned that when you take a stand, man, people will follow 
you. People will follow you, but you've got to be bold and you've got to be willing to take a stand. The Bible says that they stand before King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, even if we will not bow down. King Nebuchadnezzar gets so mad. The Bible says that he has the furnace turned up seven times hotter. Ooh, seven times hotter. I wish I could tell you that after this conference, your life's gonna get easier. But the truth of the matter is, if you take this conference serious, I'm not saying your life's gonna get easier, but your life's about to get better. Because <laughs> I believe if you take this stand tonight, I believe if you live a life bold, guess what? I believe the enemy is gonna turn that fiery furnace up seven times hotter. You ever notice that? Some of you tonight, you're gonna walk down to this altar and you're gonna say, you know what, man, God, I wanna walk in purity. And the moment you walk out of these doors after you made that commitment, some girl's gonna call you back, hey, where you at? Someone's like, I'm done with drugs and alcohol. I'm done obeying that stuff. The moment you walk out of these doors, some dude's gonna call you up going, hey, bro, we got a real party going on tonight. You ought to come over. That's what happened to Jonah, right? God spoke to him, go to Nineveh. What all of a sudden takes place? There's another boat going 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Why? Because whenever God speaks to you, there will always be a boat going in the other direction. As the worship team comes up here, Tonight, we've got to make a decision. We've got to draw a line in the sand to declare that even if our God doesn't show up the way we want him to show up, we're not going to bow down, but we're going to stand and we're going to take a public stand for God. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. So before you can say even if, you've got to sit, you've got to stand. But then thirdly, you've got to walk. You have to to walk. You have to walk. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar is so angry. He's so mad. He says, bind those boys up. Put ropes around them. Turn the furnace up seven times hotter. These boys are bound up. The furnace is seven times hotter. In fact, the word of God says that as the soldiers, as they get close to the furnace, the fire is so hot that they themselves are killed by the fire. Isn't it amazing that the thing that was meant to kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually ended up killing their enemies? Isn't this the gospel? The devil thought the cross was going to crush our Savior, but it turns out that the cross crushed the devil. The devil thought on a Friday that it was all over. But lo and behold, it was just the beginning. The Bible says these boys are thrown into the fiery furnace. And they begin to walk. I believe that these boys, they were able to walk towards that fiery furnace, unashamed, unafraid, unapologetic, because they knew who they were. And when you understand that you are a child of God, when you understand that you are saved by grace, that it's not by works, it's not by your flesh, all of a sudden, there is like a supernatural wave from heaven that comes upon you. It's called a godly confidence. I can walk through anything. I can make it through anything. I am a child of God. I know who I am. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego these were not these Hebrew boys' real name. These were their Babylonian names that were put upon them by Babylon. In fact, each one of their names, it refers to a different type of praise to a false Babylonian God. I hope you know that our world wants to put some labels on you. Our world wants to change your name. Our world wants to try and tell you who you are but you can't listen to the world. You can't have a faith that's dictated by the world. You gotta have a faith that dictates this world. The enemy's gonna try to label you. You're a loser, you're a failure, your past is too big, but you better know who you are. I was home for the holidays. 
Not too long ago, and I was with my little niece. Her name's Carolina Lee, and she's, she's beautiful. She's like this prodigy child. She's hilarious. She's so funny. And I just walked over to her. I don't get to see her nearly enough, but whenever I'm around her, I always want to affirm her. I said, Carolina Lee, I think she was about two at the time. I said, did you know that you're the prettiest little girl in all the world? She said, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. So I took a little bit further. I said, Carolina Lee, did you know that you are the best singer in all the world? She said, yeah, I already knew that. I said, who are you? I said, Carolina Lee, do you know that you're the best dancer in all the world? She said, yeah, I know. I said, Carolina Lee, do you know that you're the smartest girl in all of the world? She said, yeah, I know. I said, how do you know that? She said, because my daddy tells me so every day. When we have a world that wants to label you, you better open up your ear to your heavenly father who says you are more than a conqueror. He says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You better get the right label. You better get the right name. Because if you're ever going to have even if faith, you got to sit with someone. You got to stand for something. But then you got to walk through everything. Our God did not promise us a problem-free life. He promised us that whatever obstacle, whatever challenge we came up against, he would walk with us through it. You see, Shadrach, his name, his real name was Hananiel. And it meant Yahweh is gracious. And I can just, I can just picture Nebuchadnezzar and he says throw those boys in the fire I can just see Shadrach aka Hannah Neal say that's okay my God is gracious grace the unmerited favor of God when I'm weak he's still strong grace the empowerment of God in my weakness his grace God's grace is sufficient he says I know what my name is throw me in the fire my God's gracious Meshach, he's known as Mishael. And his name means, who is like Yahweh. I could see Mishael. He said, oh, I wish you would throw me in that fire. Ha ha. Who is like my God? Throw me in. Let's see what he's going to do. Who is like Yahweh? <laughs> Abednego. His name was Azrael, and his name means Yahweh has helped. I like that it's in the past tense, because I can see Azrael, AKA known as Abednego, going, I don't know, guys. Maybe we ought to bow down. Maybe we ought to just put one knee down. Maybe this is not how God intended it. Maybe there's another way. Maybe we should discuss it and we should debate it. But Hannah and Neil and Michelle, they said, they said, don't you know your name? You are Azariah. Your God has helped you in the past. And tonight, we don't worship for a blessing. We worship from a blessing. We don't praise God for a reward. We praise God from a reward. He has helped us. He has shown up. I have a name tonight. I can walk through anything. Stand to your feet. I can walk through anything. The Bible says these boys are thrown into the fire. I can see Nebuchadnezzar. He represents our world. He's laughing. He thinks it's all over. He goes, I got him good. I got him good. I am the man. Yet to his amazement, he starts to stare into the fire. And as he stares into the fire, he sees three guys walking around, but then there's something that is bewildering to him. There's something that doesn't make any sense to him. He sees a fourth man in the fire, and he says that fourth man in the fire, that looks like the Son of God. Guess what? It was the Son of God. Because when life heats up, that's when Jesus shows up. I think about the words of the prophet Isaiah. He says, when you walk through the waters, 
I will be with you. When you walk through the rivers, guess what? They will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Your God will walk with you. I know who I am. I can walk through anything. The Bible says those boys, they are pulled out of the fire. And when they're pulled out of the fire, only their ropes have burned off. Because when you go through the fire, everything that was binding you is loosed and you come out completely free. The Bible says Nebuchadnezzar can't believe what he's seen. He declares on that day that everybody will worship the Hebrew God. Everybody will worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Babylon, a godless, dark place, because three guys decided to let their light shine bright. All of a sudden, a revival hit that place. I wonder tonight, what would happen right here in Miami, Florida? What would happen back in your home, back in your city, if you made a decision to declare tonight, even if I'm not backing down, even if God doesn't show up the way I want him to show up, I believe he's good. I believe he's awesome. I'm going with my God tonight, even if. Come on, church, if you believe that, why don't you give God a big shout of praise all over this house? Come on, let's lift our hands. Come on, come on, come on let's sing it out.